and welcome to the weekend worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. What a joy it is to have you with us, joining us from wherever you are right now today. Thank you for making time to be with us today. If you are watching for the first time or if you're relatively new to our community, you are especially welcome among us. I invite you to visit our website, slcuu.org, or our social media channels to learn more about our congregation. I have a couple of announcements to share with you before we begin. First, if you'd like to engage with a devotional practice this spring, I invite you to join our Facebook group in reading Wild Hope by Gail Boss. We'll read this book together a little at a time during the 40 days of Lent and then share our thoughts with each other in this Facebook group. The book guides the reader through Lent by telling the stories of wild animals that are facing extinction and yet reminds us that there is still hope for our planet. You can find more details about this group on our website or in your weekly Torch email. And second, we will have two more opportunities to study the proposed eighth principle with two Zoom meetings, an evening session on Tuesday, February 16th, and an afternoon session, Sunday, March 7th. If you're curious about what it means for Unitarian Universalism to have eight principles instead of seven, or if you want to know more about how this process is unfolding, I encourage you to join a study session. Once again, those details can be found on our website or in the Torch newsletter. And now we'll begin our service as we do every Sunday morning by lighting the chalice. The flaming chalice represents Unitarian Universalism all around the world, a beacon of free religious practice and enduring values everywhere it burns. Symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and of freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. our lives, we are on the precipice of change. We're waiting to change grades in school. We're waiting to get a car, a job, a family, retire from said job, and so on and so on. We don't always know what's on the other side of change, and that can be very difficult. The Reverend Molly Gordon wrote this piece entitled Beyond Every Door about this moment of not knowing. Now, who knows the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Lucy looks for the perfect hiding place and opens up a door to a big wardrobe. She goes through the door and into the back of the wardrobe, and suddenly she's in a whole new world, a magical world with witches and fawns and even talking beavers. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a magical world beyond every door? When Lucy opened the door to Narnia, she didn't know what to expect. It didn't look anything special. It was just a boring old door in a wardrobe full of coats and clothes. But across that threshold was something different. Lucy was already stepping into Narnia before she realized quite what was happening. Many of the thresholds in our lives are like this. We don't know what's going to happen when we cross into a new place until we're already there. The door of a church takes us down a pathway of growth that we might never have expected. The door of a doctor's office suddenly opens out into a life with a hard diagnosis. A restaurant door opens to a first date and echoes forward into the relationship 
of a lifetime. A beloved person's door closes behind you and sends you out into the world heartbroken. The door to a library or a gym or a dance studio introduces you to a life of passion you might not have otherwise discovered. We cross these thresholds every day in our lives for good and ill, in joy and sorrow, in bittersweet truth. Truly, even our own front door is a great threshold, no matter how familiar the worlds within and without it may be. Given our lives' reality of constant change, every day we open the same old door again, only to step out into a world that is anew since the day we were there before. In this way, there's a new door behind every door, waiting for our discovery, if we only want to encounter it as such. Reverend Gordon's words reminds us that every day our world is changing, our church is changing. We are standing in the doorway, patiently, looking fondly behind where we have been, waiting to walk through to a new future. May it be so. Today, we're talking about going forward as a congregation into a big transition in our history. The spring will be saying so long for now to our minister of 34 years, the Reverend Tom Goldsmith. At times like these, we become aware of the long history of our congregation, of the generations that have come before us, and those for whom we are now preparing. I invite you to hear this poem by my colleague, the Reverend Sean Neil Barron, about the ways in which UU churches across our country were born and the sacred work to which they are called. With one little adaptation, to address the current moment in our history. One day, your church was born. Maybe it was a gathering of saints called together for the common worship of a wrathful God, ceaselessly praying between bouts of decrying the evils of Christmas or dancing. Or maybe a few brave souls answered a notice in the newspaper. Curiosity piqued by the announcement of a religion where free thinking and tolerance were bedrocks. No matter how it happened, your church was born, a gathering of people, humble, caring, anxious, and quirky all at the same time, who covenanted to be with one another on the journey of life, death, and everything in between. And so it began, a faithful few, beautifully imperfect, called to that central task, that human task, of connecting, loving, and serving. It was just a baby, and yet it was thrust deep into the human condition, tasked to hold minds and souls, bodies and hearts along the roller coaster of disease and birth, infighting and joy and Christmas pageants. Sometimes all of those at the same time. They gathered to hear the world broken open for insightful sermons, for rejuvenating music and a community whose fierce devotion to each other's well-being rivaled a mama bear's for her cubs. But it wasn't always like that, of course. There were the trying times. And I don't mean just Phyllis or Jack, those stubborn but lovable souls who inhabit the netherworld of committee meetings. No, I mean the trying times when the church almost split in half over the war or integration, or when the mill left the town vacant, 
or when the pandemic hit and the people weren't sure how church would work on Zoom. But somehow you, will, you were still here, still on the town common, still the church that everyone recognizes, still the ones that show up every time you are called on. New people came and they changed things, small things, big things, things that nobody noticed as they happened until suddenly it was hard to even recognize anything anymore. That was a hard moment, a tearful moment. And other things changed too. The proclamations about God, once heard loud from the pulpit, softened. Wrathful became loving. Distant became intimate. Mandatory became optional. After the war, the nursery and RE classrooms were overflowing. Each baby dedicated reminded the church of the incredible beauty of life and the gift this community, all huddled around baby, would bestow upon this child. The history of your church is more a story of the determination of love to break forth than it is about tie-dye or chalices, sermon discussions or committee meetings. The history of the church is the history of the human enterprise, evolving in its sights and sounds, yet revolving always around its core. The history of your church is the gift of potential and momentum, of baggage and personality. The history of your church is the launch pad from which you spring into action or disarray. Each day, your church is born. Unitarian Universalism is not a religion which is predisposed to great mysteries, at least not on the surface. Ours is and has always been a religion of reason in which its adherents tend to believe in what we can see, or at least what we can perceive with our senses and our minds. Yet a few mysteries do remain. And one of those mysteries is the mystery of call. From our Puritan roots, right up until today, we have said that our ministers are called to their vocation. There is a sense that ministry, whether in the pulpit or at the piano, whether with adults or with children, even ministry in hospitals and prisons is more than just a job. There is an element of the extraordinary about it. 
It is work that includes intrinsic rewards as well as provision for one's family and future, the rewards of being at the service of others. Speaking of my own call to the ministry, I can tell you that I was really good at the job I did before I became a minister, and I genuinely enjoyed it. I saved my employer's money. I turned around failing efforts. I helped my employees advance their own careers. Yet something was asking me, is this all that there is? Most of the time, that was my own voice talking to me, feeling like I was doing a really great job and still feeling unsatisfied. Sometimes it was the voices of others, people at church saying to me, hey, you know, you've really got a knack for this. Have you thought about the ministry? And sometimes, well, all I can say is that sometimes I heard another voice, a voice beyond words, another force beyond coincidence, putting things into my path, an invitation to visit a theological school, a chance meeting with a religion scholar or professor, or was it chance after all? Things just started falling into my lap. It was a mystery at the time. It still is when I think about it. One of my favorite heroes from our universalist history is Hosea Balu. If you've known me long enough, you've probably seen me wearing this t-shirt around. There's a skull inside the circle with a cross that was the emblem of the Universalist Church of America, which joined forces with the American Unitarian Association in 1961 to become the UUA that we know today. Around the circle is inscribed the slogan, Death and Glory. That's a quote from Old Reverend Balu. Hosea Balu grew up like most people in revolutionary New England as a Calvinist. The Calvinists believed in a vengeful and angry God who had decided before history began who was going to make it into heaven and who wasn't. So it really didn't matter that much what you did during your life. This gave people a lot of anxiety about whether they were in the club. So ironically, they mostly acted very piously so that other people would think that they were going to heaven. Now Hosea and his father became influenced by a new message that was starting to spread around in New England. Maybe God wasn't angry and vengeful, but loving, more like a parent. Maybe we all made it to heaven after we died, where our loving God would forgive us for everything. The young Balu came to reject the angry God and to embrace this father who would welcome everyone into heaven after they died. His belief that all humans would go straight to heaven without any punishment, came to be known, sometimes by his detractors, as a theology of death and glory. Balu started preaching at the age of 20 and soon discovered he had a talent for it. He began a career as an itinerant preacher, traveling around the countryside, preaching and teaching grade school to eke out a living. In 1794, Balu attended the Universalist Convention in Oxford, Massachusetts, and was invited to join the celebrity preacher Elhanan Winchester on the platform. Now, the legend says that at the end of what must have been a fiery and enthusiastic sermon, without warning, Winchester held the Bible against Balu's chest, crying out, 
Brother Balu, I press to your heart the written Jehovah. Well, I'm not sure what I would have done had my call to the ministry happened that way. Not much mystery in a dramatic call like that, I suppose. But it includes an important detail about the nature of ordination and call in our faith tradition. Unlike in other traditions, just getting a word from the Lord, not enough for our ministers. In Unitarian Universalism, ministers are accountable to the people they serve alongside. We live in a world in which almost all vocations have become exceedingly professionalized. One cannot carry on a legal career as a doctor, a midwife, an accountant, a plumber, without professional certification and continuing education. Most of us recognize that bad things can happen when we try to fix our own pipes, deliver our own babies, or perform our own surgeries. And yet, bad things can also happen if we trust just anybody to do this for us. We need to be sure that this person is trusted by others as well. And at the same time, traditional sources of authority are crumbling all around us. The cries to drain the swamp, while perhaps misguided, point to a belief among Americans that politicians are hopelessly, perhaps even intrinsically, corrupt and that much of the business of real politics is happening in the shadows where ordinary people cannot see it. The opioid epidemic and the anti-vaccine movement are both consequences of the abuses of power in the healthcare industry. And clergy sex abuse scandals reveal that when clergy no longer feel accountable to the people that they serve alongside, but rather to God alone, or worse, perhaps, to the church hierarchy alone, they can commit the very worst breaches of trust that make people lose their faith in clerical authority altogether. Now, this combination of professionalization with the deterioration of traditional authority means that clergy now have a much higher bar to reach than ever before. It's not enough to hear a call inside your heart. It needs to echo off the structures nearby as well. Unitarian Universalist ministers derive our authority from four sources. The first is that inner call to the vocation that sense of personal urgency about the work of one's life. The second is our professional training, which these days includes mandatory chaplaincy and sexual ethics certification. The third is the process by which we are accountable to our faith tradition. We achieve this authority by being in covenant with our colleagues, and by proving our readiness for ministry by appearing before the Ministerial Fellowship Committee, a group of lay people and clergy who provide a kind of a bar exam for new ministers and who hold us to the highest collegial standards throughout our careers. But the fourth source of our authority as ministers is the most important source of all, the source that confirms or denies the inner call, the source that endures the longest, the people in the pews. In our tradition, the congregation is the most important source of a minister's authority because in our tradition, our ministers are called from among the people. Every minister was once a lay person who heard a call for themselves and followed that call with the support of the lay people around them. Now, since this congregation was established in 1891, we have invited many ministers to serve alongside us, including 
our current senior minister, the Reverend Tom Goldsmith in 1987. Notice, I did not say that we called them to serve us. A church is not a service provider. Let me say that again. A church is not a service provider. It is a community. And the minister serves alongside the community, helping the church fulfill its mission, not the minister's. Yet, in the best of circumstances, the minister's call aligns with the congregation's call so well that a synergy develops and positive energy and growth are the fruits of our shared labor. Nowadays, we don't press the Bible into the chest of a promising candidate like back in Hosea Balu's day. The process of calling a minister is part job interview, part online dating. Yep, just like OkCupid okay or eHarmony, except it's orchestrated by the UUA. Ministers from across the country will put together their profiles, packets of information that go much deeper than a resume. Their profiles will include information about their education, their achievements, their theologies, information that tells us something about that call that they are answering. And our congregation will also put together a profile a packet of information about us, who we are demographically, our history, our finances, what kind of a minister we're looking for, who we are, who we have been, and where we want to go next. The question is, how do we know? <laughs> this is a very different congregation now than it was in 1987 when it called Reverend Tom to the pulpit. Tom himself has said that He's really served three or four different congregations in his time here. Our people grow and change. They grow old and die. New children are born and raised in our church. People move away. New friends come and join us and change us if we let them. Starting on August 1st, you will have a priceless opportunity to explore these things together. You will welcome an interim minister who will serve your congregation for two years. This interim minister will have been trained for a very unique task, helping this congregation hear its own call to ministry. Their job will be to hold up a mirror that reflects you back to yourselves so that you can see yourselves the way a new minister will see you. All the things that you've achieved together, the things you have to be proud of, the things that aren't working so well anymore, that need new ideas and new perspectives, and the potential that you have to do things you never even imagined together. Now, going through this two-year process will be like, kind of like a sabbatical for our congregation, a chance to press the pause button on many of the activities that just sort of swim along during the church year. We can question everything, examine everything. We can learn more about each other. We can pop those little social bubbles of the people who sit on the same pew every Sunday or the same people we always find during coffee hour. We will help our long-term members learn from our newer ones and from our children what the Unitarian Universalism of the future will be like. And the newer and younger will receive the tradition which the older ones place into their waiting hands. All of this is necessary so that when we call a new settled minister in the spring of 2023, we will know to what we are calling them. Calling a minister is much more than hiring a person to work for us. Much, much more than that. It is the beginning of a sacred relationship in which we and they bring our full selves to the bargain. 
you will ask them to be accountable to you. And they will ask you to be accountable to each other. You express your hopes as well as your expectations, and they will do the same. We will ask them to show us how to be the best Unitarian Universalists that we can be, and how to bring up new generations of people who will tend our flame. We live in a world that needs new language for meaning making, a world longing for belonging, full of people who don't know who to trust, our church can continue to be that beacon of hope here in Salt Lake, as we have done for 130 years, but the call is always shifting and we must learn to shift with it. Is our congregation learning to listen to its own call? If you want to honor the call of your next minister and you want them to honor your call, you must know what your call is. Imagine our church as Reverend Balu up there on that platform with a good word pressed into our hearts. If we opened that book, if we open up the book of our vocation as a community, what will it say? What are you as a member or friend of this church feeling called to do? What do you think that we are being called to do together. All of this is the task of the interim ministry upon which we will embark together this fall. But for now, we have two important tasks ahead of us. First, we must stop and embrace this moment right where we are. We have a wonderful senior minister Reverend Tom, who has served us so well and so faithfully over these 34 years, this is a time to thank him, to appreciate the gifts he's given us honoring his call to ministry and the ways in which he has honored this congregation's call. In times when we can see change on the horizon, there's often an urgency to get started right away. But the very best thing we can do right now Stop, say thank you, and enjoy the great successes we have accomplished so far. And second, we must make sure that we are ready to welcome an interim minister. It involves a substantial financial commitment, one which is going to require us all to engage in some real talk about our church's finances overall and it involves a substantial emotional commitment, one which will require each of us to consider what we are ready to commit to the success of this effort, what compromises we're ready to make, what relationships might need tending, what we might give up to make room for the new. This is sacred work we're doing together. As we move through the rest of this church year with this disposition of gratitude and waiting, I invite you to spend some time dreaming about the future that awaits us. Consider whether you might risk a greater commitment to this church community than you have undertaken before. Let yourself get excited about this process that we'll be taking up together. Let the call of our shared ministry press into your heart and take up the call when you hear it. May it be so.
Thank you once again for joining us today. And during this week's Sunday Coffee Hour, we'll have a chance to talk with our transition team, and you can ask your own questions about the ministerial transition. So please join us for that. And then, if you're a current member or pledging friend of our church, please watch your mailboxes for your pledge packet, which will be arriving in your home soon. Take a good look at it. Give it some thought. And then join us on March 7th for our Celebration Sunday service, which will be live on Zoom. This is the official kickoff to our annual pledge campaign, and it will be an opportunity for you to make a first step toward that future that we are all building together. Let us close our service today with these words by the Reverend Gordon McKeeman. Ministry is a quality of relationship between and among human beings that beckons forth possibilities, inviting people into deeper, more constant, more reverent relationship with the world and with one another, carrying forward a long heritage of hope and liberation that has dignified and informed the human venture over many centuries. Whenever there is a meeting that summons us to our better selves, wherever our lostness is found, our wounds begin healing, our fragments are united. There is ministry. <laughs>